loot boxes. You know them, and you probably hate them. But at the beginning, they appeared to be just another way to reward players for their in-game accomplishments. Yet underneath the hood was something far more sinister. Not too long ago, it seemed like every franchise had these damn things in them. While some studios maintained integrity like Nintendo and found different means of revenue, others fell victim to the oldest sin of man. It didn't matter if it was a AAA studio or an indie developer. It didn't matter if a title was complete at release, a buggy disaster, or an early access. Developers did not care if loot boxes compromised their years of blood, sweat, and hard work, or if they contradicted and dismantled what fans loved about a series. And in some cases, having a functional in-game store was more important than a functional product. Loot boxes never discriminated against any genre. RPG, first-person shooter, multiplayer, fighting, racing, even single-player games. Not the single player! Loot boxes were everywhere. It was an epidemic. And with that type of cash flow, it looked like the loot box wars would continue for generations. While it seemed impossible that anything could be more controversial in the realm of gaming than Jack Thompson, Gamergate, or the Xbox One's original reveal, or even the Ouya, Fallout 76, loot boxes quickly became the most despised thing by all gamers. For the last eight or so years, RNG loot crates became an unstoppable virus infecting the entire industry. And yet, Despite every horrible thing that's happened in the year 2020, a new age approaches. One with a vaccine. Do you consider loot boxes to be a, an, an ethical feature? So what we look at as, as surprise mechanics. Yeah, fuck you two! An age where loot boxes will not feel so good, Mr. Stark and be cast away into economic textbooks where they will remain forever. But, how did we get here? And more importantly, what caused the rise and fall of the loot box? This game is a Star Wars themed online casino. Is this good for the plot? Designed to lure kids into spending money. It's a trap. It's a trap! And it feels like Valve itself has specifically designed this game to operate almost exactly like a slot machine. Is this good for the player? And the game award goes to, oh man, I have to pay a microtransaction to unlock. That's so. These kind of mechanics, and, and FIFA, of course, is our big one, our FIFA Ultimate Team in our packs, is actually quite ethical and quite fun, enjoyable to people. X-Men merchandise is now available at MadeByStarStuff.com. Go chiggity check it out, mate. It's totally cool. Legends say that on a dark, stormy night, a young Australian man set foot within a forgotten cemetery in London on a faded grave bore the name Karl Marx. The man fell to his knees and shouted towards the sky, Is this good for the player? It was then that the ghost of Karl Marx arose from his casket and told the young Australian of a plan to destroy capitalism. And so, Andrew Wilson returned to his laboratory, where he plotted and schemed for days, weeks, months, and years. Until one day, one fateful evening, he crept into EA headquarters, barged into the shareholders' top-secret meeting, and lay the blueprints for his terrible plan before their very eyes. It was on that fateful day that the loot box was conceived. Well, it was probably a bit less dramatic than that. To be real, I've memed on Andrew Wilson in the past, but truly, he has the biggest part to play in all of this. To understand the rise and fall of the loot box, we have to understand the evolution of video game monetization. So open your textbooks to page 69, ha 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 ha, yeah very funny, and I'll educate you. Our first lesson, please examine the graph on screen. You'll see how the price of video games has changed since 1977, with adjustments for inflation, from the Atari 2600 to the NES, 
Genesis, Super Nintendo, all the way through to modern day. Now do you notice something? The retail price for a standard video game has stayed the same for the last 30 years. If only the same could be said about college tuition. Can you think of any other business that hasn't changed the cost of their product in 30 years? I only know of one. Costco hot dogs, baby. So as video games became more ambitious and expensive to produce, publishers, shareholders, and developers needed to find other ways to earn back their investment and turn a profit. Or so we are led to believe. At the turn of the millennium, downloadable content, map packs, and expansions became popular. Which was perfect because these things were much faster and easier to develop than a brand new game. Better yet, they added on to already great titles. Yes, I would love 9 new maps for Halo 2. Thank you so much. Going into the 360, PS3, and Wii generation, most AAA titles had some kind of DLC, big or small. Xbox had avatar outfits, gamer picks, wallpapers. We also saw the rise of collectors or special editions. Subscription models emerged with World of Warcraft and EverQuest. Seasons passes started popping up everywhere. Annual releases of very similar titles kept budgets down. But why am I taking you on this history lesson? Because companies are constantly trying to find the most effective way to monetize their games without directly raising the price. I said directly. DLC and map packs used to be common until fans got tired of a fractured player base. And so many companies went the free DLC route. Season passes were common until, once again, fans got tired of paying up front for content later. Many trends have come and gone, and often what once used to work and make shitloads of money no longer does. Now this is just my theory, but you can really see the effect of the $60 price tag on the game industry in recent years. The reason we see so many titles launch in unplayable, disastrous, embarrassing ways is because the companies have to cut corners. There's no way we can get all this work done. Maybe we should delay it? Nope, just push it out and worry about it later. Of course, this could also just be laziness or greed, but when looking at all these things as a whole, it's no surprise why microtransactions emerged. What I've just laid out is the trail of different monetization schemes and practices, a trail that has two final stops on our journey. What I've noticed is a lot of these quote unquote outdated sales tactics were largely successful because of consumer ignorance. But once everyone began to realize just how annoying and repetitive this shit was getting, that's when we all stood together, held hands, had a beer, and said, you'll stop doing this. No more of that. That's when we start to see change. Meanwhile, the greedy capitalist pigs were hard at work. We need to make more money, guys. What if we create a system where players can make smaller purchases but without any limit on how many? I'll do you one better, fuckface. What if we tie those purchases to the actual gameplay experience? You think your dick is huge? Let's reward players paying real money with blatant advantages over those cheap bastards who won't give us money. I've got you beat, Chad. Let's do all that, but in a slot machine. Holy fuck, Fred. God damn, that's greedy and I love it. The result? Two types of terrible diseases. Microtransactions, which could be in exchange for currency, your soul, yada yada yada, and loot boxes. It's funny to think that the first microtransaction that really pissed people off was like the horse armor in Oblivion. But in hindsight, horse armor was the least offensive of all. You might think loot boxes and microtransactions originated from mobile gaming, but this is wrong. While we had seen similar things in games like MapleStory, the origin of the biggest outbreak was none other than FIFA. Sports games since 2008, before, and even now have been the most repetitive genre in all of gaming. But FIFA 2009 changed everything. It was the first pay-to-win console video game ever created. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be the last. FIFA's ultimate team mode was a dream come true for shareholders. Take the world's most popular sport with the best and most recognizable players from around the globe. Have card packs, assemble the ultimate team, and pay money to do it. So naturally, the more packs you opened, the better chance you had to get the best players. 
Andrew Wilson was the executive producer of FIFA 09, and he was the man who authorized the monetization of FIFA's ultimate team. But it wouldn't stop at FIFA. It would spread to 2K Basketball and Madden. From that point on, EA felt a change in the winds. I think I feel a change in the winds, says I. And their profits skyrocketed over the next several years. They went from a company value of $5 billion in 2008 to $44 billion in 2018. Another familiar name, Activision Blizzard, followed suit, going from a value of $20 billion in 2008 to $61 billion in 2018. Ultimate Team was so profitable that in 2019 it made up 28% of EA's total revenue. This massive increase was unheard of. Other companies saw the financial success of FIFA's Ultimate Team. Jealous and conniving, they sat there and thought, how can we bring this to our product? They all scrambled to replicate it, and that's when the virus spreaded like wildfire. Halo? Infected. Call of Duty? Infected. Rainbow Six? Infected. 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 Shadow of War, Madden, Battlefront, Halo Wars 2, Advanced Warfare, Black Ops 3, Infinite Warfare, COD World War 2, Black Ops 4, Fortnite, Destiny 2, Mass Effect 3, Forza Motorsport 7, Gears of War 5, Need for Speed, Overwatch, Battlefield 1, Elder Scrolls Online, The Division, The Division 2, PUBG, CSGO, H1Z1, Lawbreakers, EVE Online, Black Squad, Apex Legends, Hearthstone, Heroes of the Storm, Dota 2, Critical Ops, NBA 2K, Team Fortress 2, Street Fighter 5, Paladins, Fable Fortune, Assassin's Creed Origins, Pwned, Resident Evil 3, Mass Effect, Andromeda, Battlefield, Hardline, Smite, Guild Wars, to League of Legends. <gasps> Just a couple examples. I'll tell you the problem with the scientific power that you're that you're using here. Uh, it didn't require any discipline to attain it. You know, you read what others had done, and you and you took the next step. You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves, so you don't take any responsibility for it. You stood on the shoulders of geniuses uh, to accomplish something as fast as you could, and before you even knew what you had, you, you patented it, and packaged it, and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and now you're selling it. You want to sell it. Well, our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. But despite infecting so many different types of video games, the exact same symptoms occurred with loot box fever. A slot machine that mostly churns out a bunch of useless crap, and rarely something good. Presented in the exact same copy-pasted layout with color-coded items to signal rarity, the act of opening a crate was scientifically engineered to release as much dopamine in the brain as possible with cheerful sound effects. Confetti! And it made you confident that you were spending your money on something that made you happy. For whatever reason, Nobody in the government seemed to recognize the obvious danger of these loot box systems. How they exploited children, how there was no limit set up, no age verification system. The government didn't realize how prevalent loot boxes were becoming or how much money they were making. I mean, you'd think the US government would tax the bejesus out of this. But no, you know, it might be illegal to bring kids into a casino, but there was no law against bringing the casino to them. Because it was so profitable, easy to create, and completely unregulated, there was no limit to how terrible loot box systems could be abused. None of these games had a screen that popped up and said, uh, hey buddy, we noticed you've spent $5,000 on Overwatch skins in the last two days. We're gonna prevent you from making any more terrible decisions. Yet what are all loot boxes based on? What is at the core? RNG, a random number generator, gotcha system. RNG decides the outcome of a slot machine, a dice roll, many other things. It's not a new concept to seasoned nerds and gambling addicts. Mario Party is filled with randomness and chance that can heavily affect the outcome of a match. World of Warcraft had rare item drops from enemies that you sometimes had to grind hours or days for. Even I remember the thrill of opening a new pack of Yu-Gi-Oh cards and seeing a secret rare Jinzo in front of my face. And that was the first boner I ever got. There's something innately exciting about taking a risk, not knowing what you're gonna get. It's that same thrill that loot boxes tapped into. 
but without any risk on the part of the developers. Humans are foolishly hopeful, no matter how mathematically insane the odds might be. Am I an anime villain yet? That's why so many people buy lottery tickets and gamble on CSGO skins, because even though you are more likely to be struck by a lightning than win the lottery, the chance is there and that's all that matters. So you're telling me there's a chance. Now why are loot boxes problematic? Well, I'm going to say something incredibly shocking and brave. Loot boxes are not a problem for video games. Easy oh, Wait for no. it. Wait for it. Monetizing them is. Take a virtual version of a card game. Yu-Gi-Oh! Legacy of the Duelist has random packs, no money involved. Get them all purely through gameplay. Vermintide 2 is the same deal. But by playing on higher difficulties, grabbing items that make the levels more challenging, the player can actually upgrade the loot boxes they get, not monetized. These progression systems actually prove that loot boxes can work when done right. The problem is, the second you monetize them, you open the door to every corrupt anti-consumer practice there is. Artificial grinds, limited resources, restricting players' ability to customize, a barrage of useless crap made specifically to act as filler so players don't unlock everything too quickly. Any company who wants to make money off of loot boxes is going to do everything in their power to incentivize the purchase. Uh, wait, won't wreck packs with special weapons break the exquisitely refined balance of arena multiplayer? Secure your noise hole, soldier! Grown-ups are talking. Damn it. Infinite Warfare offering objectively better weapons. Halo 5 and Halo Wars 2 created entire game modes with the sole intent of selling packs. They paywalled the emblems in a freaking Halo game. PUBG was an embarrassment on the Xbox One, yet its store was still fully functional. Forza locking away cars and putting a little tag that says buy me next to them. Illegal sales and false advertising in Fallout 76. Oh yeah, loot boxes could make shit loads of cash, but always at the cost of the integrity of the game. You had to sacrifice your sense of pride and accomplishment. If DICE and EA had no desire to sell loot boxes, if they just thought that was the best system for Battlefront 2, they wouldn't have made the grind to unlock heroes and villains so tedious in the first place. Now this brings up a key difference between loot boxes that affect gameplay and ones that don't. While Overwatch's system is tied exclusively to loot crates, at the very least it's all cosmetic and doesn't give any player an objective advantage. It's kind of stupid and boring that this is the only method of rewards they could come up with, but far less devious than pay to win. The problem with loot boxes is not only that the system was so common and repetitive, but it replaced what could have been a better system for delivering rewards. Loot boxes are problematic in the same way scratch tickets are. The company that controls the odds will never create odds that would result in them losing money. They make the rules, so they win. But even worse, loot boxes offer goods that are self-contained within the digital world, meaning you can't trade or resell them like Magic the Gathering cards. There's a lot of people who buy card packs in bulk and are able to resell the contents to make a profit or at least some money back. But when it's a closed economy that the developers have full control over, whatever you get from a loot box outside of the game it's worthless. The exception, of course, being Diablo 3's marketplace, which makes me puke, and CSGO skin betting, which makes me eat my own poop. It's from here! The difference between a casino and a loot box is the casino might pay you back 20 bucks after you've spent 100. A loot box doesn't pay you anything, no matter how lucky you are. And another thing, a game like poker or blackjack requires actual skill, knowledge, and input from the person gambling money. If you're still not getting what I'm saying, imagine you have the trophy slot machine from Melee. Now just think if you had to pay to actually use the slot machine. It'd be disgusting, wouldn't it? Unacceptable! Imagine if Black Ops wager matches involved real money. I just want to illustrate how many problems can arise when you monetize a specific aspect of a game. The bottom line, objectively speaking, loot boxes are a form of gambling, and they were unregulated. 
But gambling itself is something that can be fun and rewarding. It's simply impossible to maintain a game's integrity if you monetize randomness and chance. So let's recap. Loot boxes were the replacement for paid DLC and map packs. They became an insanely successful practice in a short amount of time, but with huge underlying ethical problems that most people didn't care about. For a while, anytime a new game was announced, my first thought was, please don't have loot boxes, son of a bitch. I'd sigh and think, is this what my favorite industry is gonna look like forever? But then one day, Doom Guy, Master Chief, Gordon Freeman, The Arbiter, Mario, Kaiba, and Ash Ketchum banded together and fought back, and the Flood suffered their first defeat. A single straw would break the camel's back. I have had enough of you! Yes! The Battlefront 2 loot box controversy opened the floodgates and released the Kraken. And I can't help but remember a story in my life that perfectly reflects this. When I was in high school, somebody in my group of friends found a set of keys that opened every door to the school. Now I'm not proud of this, but we used to go into the concession stand and steal candy. The school never noticed, and we did this for a couple of months, until one day, somebody got too carried away and decided to take the money out of there. Again, pretty shitty thing to do, I'm not proud of it, don't do it, if you are, you're stupid. After the money was stolen, they locked everything down, changed the locks, nobody could get in. It wasn't until we pushed the envelope so far that it all came crashing down, just like loot boxes. In this analogy, EA was the person who took the money. In the last couple years, the loot box epidemic has been quarantined and vaccinated with haste. Not completely, but no company wants to suffer the shitstorm EA did. Now if you don't believe loot boxes have fallen, that's fine, but you have to admit, they are in the process of falling. Through media reporting and massive amounts of complaints, the legal world has responded. Chris Lee, a member of the Hawaii House of Representatives, blasted EA and BF2 publicly. The Federal Trade Commission hosted a workshop to discuss consumer awareness and educate the community about the dangers of loot boxes. Legislation in several countries was introduced to ban manipulative design features, make it illegal to sell loot boxes to minors. A Dutch court recently fined EA $10 million. And while the audience for sports games doesn't seem to care at all about loot boxes, even FIFA has been under fire lately. It's crazy how deep the rabbit hole goes, and I'm truly proud of it all. In the face of overwhelming negativity, EA, Activision, and other companies gave their best effort to justify loot boxes as totally cool. First, we don't call them loot boxes. I think that was whatever some, term but, but, you wish to apply yeah, to them. So, do so, you consider them ethical? So, what we look at as as surprise mechanics. But their attempts only made the ship sink faster as other companies started to abandon ship. Rocket League removes loot boxes. Destiny 2 doesn't let you pay real money for engrams anymore. Forza 7 gets rid of them. Fortnite eliminates the randomness by letting you see what's in the crates. Modern Warfare was rumored to have loot boxes at launch, but didn't. The entire market and microtransactions in Shadow of War is completely ripped out. PUBG gets rid of random locked loot boxes. Payday 2 revises their system to make sure the studio is Quote, in compliance with the relevant laws. Gears 5, Heroes of the Storm, Warframe, Battlefront 2, and so many others either removed loot boxes or made drastic changes to the current system. This is a pattern. In the last year or so, loot boxes have become a liability. It's not a good look to wear. The winds are changing, and greedy corporations can't hide behind vague or non-existent laws any longer. Consumers are ignorant no more. You might think it's purely because of benign reasons that publishers and developers turned away from loot boxes, but I think the more obvious motive is they've found something better. The Battle Pass. Yes, the new monetization scheme Fortnite made popular. While not a perfect system, I believe it's far better than what we had before. The rise of loot boxes felt like an eternity, a dark chapter of gaming with no end in sight. We sat by and watched franchise after franchise succumb to this horrible parasite. While it's easy to point the finger at EA and Andrew Wilson for making the pay-to-win model so mainstream, the blame lies with everyone for how out of hand this got. 
all the companies that took advantage of a corrupt system, the lawmakers who didn't regulate it for years, and the community who was manipulated into complacency. But hopefully this is all in the past, as I firmly believe the game industry is headed for a bright and noble future. X-Men merchandise is now available at MadeByStarStuff.com Go chiggity check it out, mate. It's totally cool.